everyone, uh, no mai haramai ki tēnei hui. Uh, welcome to this prosperous Napier committee meeting this morning in June. Could we please all stand for our opening karakia? Tutawa mai runga, tutawa mai raro, tutawa mai roto, tutawa mai waho. Kia tau ai te Māori tū, te Māori ora, ki te katoa, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Thank you. I hope you're all nice and warm. It's a bit chilly out there. Um, just a reminder that this meeting is being live streamed this morning on Council's Facebook page. Uh, we will start with our apologies. I have those from Deputy Mayor Brosnan and Fire Evelyn Latima from Ngama Nukunuku Oti Iwi. Can I have someone to move those, please? Thank you, Councillor Mawson. Second in, Councillor Tareha. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Um, calling for any conflicts of interest on our agenda today? No. Nope. Uh, announcements by the Mayor. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. I do want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the passing of Byron Buck Buchanan, um, who passed away uh, on Saturday, the 25th of May, aged 101 years old, um, sadly four weeks short of his 102nd birthday. Um, Byron was a very well-known uh, local here in Hawke's Bay. He was uh, a QSM and uh, he served in the Second World War uh, gunner in, in Italy, and I had the honour of listening to him uh, speak at the Taradale IRSA Anzac service just two years ago where he talked of his uh, adventures whilst he was um, serving, and I can tell you he, he really is um, a character. Mm. And I guess he's more well known here in Hawke's Bay uh, as a, bu a businessman, um, 35 years, owning the Storkford Lodge Hotel, and then after that, in 1986, he bought our um, treasured T&G building, mm. from which he ran Buck's Great Wall Restaurant, a conference centre, and um, the penthouse suites that are still located there now. He has been an active member in many, many local clubs and organisations, including the Napier Night Lions Club for 61 years and the JCs, uh, and he was also the patron for the Napier Golf Club. In more recent years, he has lived with his wife at the Riversdale Lifestyle Village uh, in, in Taradale and very much endeared himself to the other residents there, and I was... Um, very grateful to have been able to go and visit him there myself several times um, just to check on him because I personally had known him for 33 years. Um, he was a huge supporter of my political aspirations from the age of 17 uh, when I met him in Toastmasters. So um, very sad to see him go, but um, and I say all this with a smile because Buck was very much the kind of person that said we all must live each life uh, each each day, um, you know, and make the, the best of our lives. So I know that he would want us all um, to acknowledge, to celebrate his life and, and carry on. So I did just want to take the time to do that today. So thank you. Kia ora, moi mai ra, Buck. Mm. It's beautiful. Um, do we have any announcements by our management this morning? No, nothing. Thank you. Well, we'll kick off with our confirmation of minutes. So I'm looking for someone to move that the minutes of the Prosperous Nature Committee meeting held on Thursday, the 2nd of May, be taken as a true and accurate record of the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Mawson, and seconded by Councillor Crystal. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. I will call for any minor matters not on the agenda. Anyone have anything this morning? No? Great. Well, we'll move into our agenda items. First up, we have our Treasury Activity and Funding Update. I'll use the normal um, title this time and welcome Gary to the table to present. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so the purpose of the report is to update Prosperous Napier Committee on Council's uh, Treasury Activity. Uh, so before we go any further, I just need to point out a couple of errors, um, a little bit of wonky maths um, with the total cash and deposits. It should read 27. Uh, million three hundred eighty nine thousand not the nine million four hundred and twenty eight I apologize for that and the other one for some inexplicable reason I turned council is currently compliant with its treasury management policy into a question is it? the answer is yes it is <laughs> so, and all sleep tonight um, <laughs> So, uh, council currently sits at 20 million of borrowing, um, and as I said, it's, it's, it, this is well below the, the original forecast of 67 million for the end of the financial year. 
and there's no further lending expected for the remainder of this month. Um, I'll take the remainder of the paper as read. Thank you, Gary. We'll open for questions. I'll kick off. I do have one. So it's around the credit rating process mm -hmm. and the fact that um, we will undertake that process once we hit the 100 million of external borrowings. I'm wondering when is that forecast for? When do we hit that level? Uh, so at the, at the moment, we're looking at that potentially um, at the end of next year or even into the year after. So mm -hmm. um, we've still got a little bit of time there, but um, we're, we're not expecting um, that borrowing to increase uh, significantly for several more years. So we do have a little bit of space, uh, time and space there. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No? Great. Well, our recommendation in front of us is that we receive the report titled Treasury Activity and Funding Update. Can I have someone to move that, please? Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Seconder? Councillor Wilson, oh, we're all up on this side of the room today. Um, all those in favour, oh, would you like to speak to it, sorry? Well, just to say, I, I move the motion on, on uh, with the corrections, noted. Thank you, yep. Thank you Madam Chair. Noted. Thank you. Thank you. Just great work, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to it? No. Well, I will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Cool. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, next, we have the Napier City Council Greenhouse Gas Emissions Climate Mitigation Plan, um, and I'd like to welcome Michelle to present. Thank you. Just wondering how I get the presentation up. <laughs> This one here, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, well, the purpose of my report today really is to provide background information on the work we've been doing to measure Napier City Council's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this is necessary work before we can recommend an emission reduction target and develop the emission reduction plan for Council. So I just wanted to take you through some of the background um, and feel free to jump in if there's questions. So this is the regional footprint for Hawke's Bay. Um, this work is done by the Regional Council, so 4,340 tonnes of carbon dioxide, um, with the major emission source being agriculture. Then we drop down to being Napier City Council from a TLA perspective. This was the community footprint, 443,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that means Napier City as a community is about 10% of the region's emissions. Okay, so what have we been doing? We've been looking inwards at council's own emissions. So these are originating from the assets that council owns and controls. Um, the facilities and the services that it provides to the community. We've been measuring the baseline um, and we've had that also externally verified to make sure um, <clears throat> we're including all the material emission sources. Um, so we've been doing this work under the financially sustainable strategic priority, um, measuring the emissions in accordance with the ISO standard. So just to give you some context about what's included in that, it's pretty much all of Napier City Council's facilities um, all the infrastructure that we're building, three waters, transportation, and it also includes the um, centralised functions around as well as well around governance and um, city strategy. So council's own emissions um, are 36,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, and this is about 8% of the community footprint. So it's actually quite significant, um, and I think Council has an important role to play here in terms of leadership. Um, before we can go out to the community or the region more broadly, we have to sort of take responsibility for the emissions that are resulting from Council's own, own assets. 
this graph jet really just presents that in another way and shows you that the biggest emission sources for council um, emissions are coming from capital goods and also from purchased goods and services. So these are we call scope three. Sure. Just sorry, just a question through the chair. So are those things um, like track coming into the council things we buy and Correct. what it costs to get them here? Correct. Okay. Yep. So basically, it's the procurement <coughs> processes. Um, The Category 1 emissions cover basically the fleet. They also, um, natural gas, which is burnt in seven facilities, we've got gas boilers. Uh, also covers the wastewater treatment plant. The treatment and the discharge generates um, methane and nitrous oxide emissions just through the biological processes there. We also have Lagoon Farm, which has got obviously livestock gra grazing there. And then we have um, heating, ventilation equipment all throughout the different buildings and assets, which have got refrigerant gases as well. <clears throat> Category two is about electricity use. So council has more than 500 ICP connections across all of the facilities. Uh, we have two suppliers, Meridian and Manawa, um, we use a significant amount of electricity in the year, spend nearly three and a half million dollars. Um, and so that contributes just over a thousand tonnes to the emissions profile. Then when we get into category three and three through to five, this is the capital goods and the purchase goods and services. Um, and this comprises, you know, 29,000 of the 36,000 tonnes of council's own emissions. Through you, Madam Chair, can I just ask a question at this point? I think it's relevant at this Certainly. point. It's a question I had for later. My question is, we count these things because we are the end user? How we, sure we have operational control. Yeah, so how sure are we that in the bigger scheme of things, this isn't being double counted? In other words, suppliers aren't counting them, the, the original manufacturers aren't counting yep. them. How, how certain are we that the responsibility is being correctly Yeah, paid? apportioned. Yep. Yeah, so... With the carbon accounting standard, basically what is considered category one and category two for council, so those are the assets that are under council's operational control. Um, those, those are the ones that we should be focusing on. Those categories three to five, you're correct. It is council's scope three or category three, and it'll be somebody else's category one, category two because we don't own the vehicles and the equipment that is building the infrastructure, but council is engaging those contractors to build that infrastructure on its behalf. So the roads, the buildings, um, yeah. So it is often kind of considered double counting, but it's, it's not, it's just in the terms of the standard and how you have to report it. Um, it's council scope three and somebody else's scope one. So if we are both measuring it and both working towards emission reduction, it will be counting in both profiles. So long as the rate payers only paying what they're due oh, is, is the question I'm asking really. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is quite complex, I do. Um, yeah, I understand that. Um, so we sought independent assurance for this baseline inventory. It's really important to do that if you're going to start reporting it publicly and if you're going to set an emission reduction target, you need to make sure that the baseline is accurate and includes all material emission sources. So the next steps in this work is really to set the targets in alignment with science and with the New Zealand national targets and also our regional targets that have already been adopted. Um, I can tell you now the long-term target is you know, pretty straightforward, net zero by 2050, that's alignment with science and with our national targets, along with a 24 to 47% reduction in methane. The challenging part is the interim target, which is by 2030 or 2035. Um, it needs to be quite ambitious and it needs to also be achievable. 
and also bearing in mind the constraints we have on budget mm. and resource and capabilities. Another <coughs> question um, about one of those um, points about um, add climate implications to council reports and guidance for officers. Do you know how realistic this is or when it might happen? Is it a staff resourcing issue? Is it going to make a big change to the papers we receive? I think it's important if you're making decisions, you need to have that information in front of you so you know what the impacts are. Um, other councils are already doing it, so there is a lot of guidance out there we could adopt and look, look to implement. Um, it's not a decision that I can make, but it's a recommendation that I'm putting to you that I think that's something we should be thinking about. Okay. Okay. Not, it's not in this paper as a recommendation, but it'll be in the next one along with the targets and how we're going to achieve those targets. So I suppose today is opportunity to give me some feedback whether that's something you would support. Councillor Brown. Yeah, kia ora. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, I was just wondering around, I'll throw the chair. Um, I can't remember where we're up to with reviewing our procurement policies and just as a lot of the, our emissions are through our procured items, is, this, is there a plan to link carbon accounting in with our procurement processes? I'm pretty sure the procurement policy is due for renewal or revi revision later this year, and I have talked to the procurement team. Um, I think that it would be a really great idea to bring it into the procurement. Um, part of the work I'm doing at the moment is understanding what the barriers might be with different teams and whether it's a resourcing issue or um, other areas that are, you know, going to make it difficult or, yeah, mm -hmm. understanding what, what the potential is to be able to do that. Yeah, two, two questions through you, Madam Chair. First question, reasonably simple one. Are the calculations on assumed CO2 emissions or are they on actual CO2 emissions? In other words, are they are they around what we're planning to achieve or are they around what we have actually achieved? In other words, the cost, if there are any costs, do they occur before we incur the expense or do they occur after we've completed, say, a capital activity? So the measurement is on actual emissions, so based on what um, fuel has been burnt, what electricity has been consumed, those kind of things. Um, the co cost is being incurred right now because we're burning those fuels, we're sending waste to landfill, burning electricity every day. Um, there is no cost to the carbon emissions at this stage, like we are voluntarily reporting it when the council's not a mandatory reporting entity, it's not part of the ETS. So there is, I mean, there's a cost on things already, like fuel already has a, car, a tax on it that's passed through to end consumers. So there is that aspect of cost. But um, what I'm trying to do is look at, in, in the emission reduction plan, look at things that are delivering benefits, financial benefits really, and the carbon benefit is a, a co-benefit of that. Mm -hmm. Carbon and cost are really linked together because it's, it is about fuel use or it's about electricity use or it's waste that we're generating or waste that we're putting, pumping out to the, you know, through the wastewater treatment plant, really. Thank you. And my second question, just down in the fourth paragraph, it says next steps. That's why I'm raising it now because it's mm. the heading, next steps. Yep. Engage with key directorates. So at this stage, is this report an academic exercise, a tabletop exercise, and other staff haven't been engaged? My real question is, once the directorates are in, in, engaged, will we see a change to the profiling? So directorates have been engaged in terms of gathering the data for this invent for the inventory. They were certainly engaged with that. Um, and then there's been engagement back to them to provide the results and feedback um, through the ELT, but also through an all of council um, teams meeting. Um, what was the next part of the question? In terms yeah, of whether, the, whether the, the engagement. And the yep. profiling. Yeah. So, um, I think it's a work in progress, like this is an iterative thing. And at the moment, 
emissions is not factored into the decision makings around mm. infrastructure or um, procurement or things like that. So it's a work in progress. I think we'll be moving towards that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McGrath. Yes, just through the chair, with all the measuring that, that you do, do we measure our contractors such as uh, the rubbish and recycling um, collectors? Yep. yep. Yes, that's included in the category three to five because we obviously don't own those vehicles, but we um, procure those services. So at the moment in the inventory calculation, it's based on a spend-based emission factor. So those sit... The, um, yeah, those factors are available based on Auckland Council's work, actually. So they have, if you know what the contract value is, you can apportion the emissions associated from that. So yes, it is included. Cool. Yeah, it's not just, not just our capital projects then. No. Nope. Cool. Councillor Crystal. Um, through the Chair, so in, in part of this, how do you measure the mitigations we're doing? How do you measure the tree planting that's going on in the communities and stuff? Does that come into this? Um, it's not in there at the moment because the, the guidance and the standard around how you account for um, sequestration really only applies to um, forestry, so native forestry or plantation forestry. There isn't a methodology around capturing planting um, in a more localised kind of area. That's just the standard. I know it doesn't make sense. It doesn't capture things like carbon captured by um, orchards or vineyards either. So um, there is work going on to bring in a methodology of capturing data f uh, around wetland restoration, so blue carbon. Yep, so it's an evolving kind of area. Thank you. Um, just, just to follow on from that solar, private solar and everyone, is, is any of that captured or is there a way of doing it? Yes, that would be captured, but at the moment, so none of the council buildings have solar on them. Oh, um, you know, private people that have solar. So, yes, it would be captured under the Category 2, um, so not in council's own inventory, but in the community-wide one, it would be captured under that um, stationary energy because we would, if you've got solar on, you're drawing less down from the national grid, so it would be captured. Because there's a lot around now. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's also a lot of empty roof space that could have more. <laughs> I'm just checking, Michelle. Was this your last slide? Um, I've got on one, with, one I've more. To them back. <laughs> I know. I've got one more to just to tell you some of the things that are underway. So even though it's not in the decision making process yet, um, or in the procurement process, th there are things happening within council. So. We have a subscription to this tool called Moata. So in the concept design phase for projects, we can look at the different low carbon options and, and we're using that in some projects. Um, we could definitely roll that out a lot wider and use it on all infrastructure projects. We're trialling some low carbon concrete, 45% um, lower emissions, and we're doing that in concrete curbing and channels. That was in um, Ahuriri West Key project. We've also switched to emulsion-based bitumen for the chip sealing. So that, that is really just a specification change and a procurement approach, working with the um, contractors who deliver those projects. So again, very little cost to council. It just comes down to making smarter choices in the specifications. Um, we've had energy audits done on Ocean Spa looking at options to replace the boiler with something that's not going to use natural gas, um, and also looking at options to be more energy efficient, sharing the load and demand with the conference centre, which is right beside it. Um, yeah, we're looking at energy management much more closely across the organisation, so looking at the bills that come in, making sure we're on the right um, plans and that there's not inefficiencies happening there. So, yeah, there's, there is a lot of work going on already, even though it's not um, captured in those decision-making kind of processes. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Councillor Simpson. 
Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Michelle. This has been quite enlightening, really. Mm. I'll never get this time back, but um, <laughs> it's quite enlightening. Um, the, um, the question I have is you raised the issue around us being 8% of the community mm -hmm. take. Yep. Um, my question is, can we compare ourselves, and I appreciate there's a whole lot of different matrixes, uh, the number of staff, our operational spend, our capital spend, but are we able to identify other equivalent local governments with equivalent profile um, that would give us an idea as to whether we're actually above or below the norm? I yeah. think because that's one of the gaps that currently exists is how do we compare yeah. with other either government departments or local authorities to ensure that, A, we're moving at the same pace mm -hmm. or we're doing better in reducing our emissions? Yep, definitely that data is available. Um, it is a bit tricky to compare because each council has got different sorts of facilities. Not everybody has Ocean Spa or Kennedy Park. Um, some councils have more than one wastewater treatment plant, for example. Um, they don't own their own landfill. So it is a bit difficult, but we can do it on a per capita basis and understand um, where Napier City would sit in comparison to other councils. Yeah, thank you. So just a follow-on question from me then, Michelle. Is that something, that monitoring aspect is what I'm assuming you're alluding mm. to, Councillor Simpson. So is that something that would come back to us next meeting in the plan? Correct. Yeah, so perfect. we're nearly at the end of the 24 financial year, so shortly we'll be looking to update the work that we did for last year to give us a footprint for the 24 financial year. Um, I've also been looking at the forecasting going forward, like looking at what is proposed in terms of the infrastructure plan over the next 10 years, um, I can tell you now that that's looking like increasing emissions rather than decreasing. So we have got a challenge ahead of us if we're going to commit to um, these reduction targets, especially around the infrastructure build. And the monitoring of... Um, Progress. ...cities... Mm -hmm similar profile to ours per capita, mm -hmm. that can be included in the... I can. Yeah, yep. perfect. Thank perfect. you. Uh, Councillor Gregg. Oh, yes, through the chair. Um, looking at the chart on page 18 of the report, um, we see walking and cycling projects. Um, central government funding has been withdrawn. Mm. I'm just thinking, as a council, can we still prioritise that and work towards more walking and cycling, even though central government's withdrawn their funding? I would think so. I mean... That's your choice as councillors to prioritise those projects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe a point of order there, Councillor Greg. I'm not quite sure this is the right um, paper to be, <laughs> or the right question to be asking um, at this time, but point taken. Yes, thank you. Mm. Councillor Bogue. Um, Madam Chair, I was going to ask a similar question. It's probably out of order too, mm. but what difference is that going to make, having the government having withdrawn? What Could somebody tell us what sort of projects we're not going to be doing? because of that? Mm. I don't know, I have all the yeah. details on that, but I mean, there is significantly less funding from the current government for carbon reduction projects in general, mm. um, right. but they have switched it kind of from a focus on decarbonisation to, like for example, they've committed to 10,000 EV charges across the country, that's a lot, and there is funding for that. So I think it's just about Understand, and that's part of the work I've been to doing also, is developing those relationships with ECA, um, who has the central government funding. Um, and they are able to fund some of these energy audits and the feasibility studies or co-fund those. So being able to tap into that is important. Um, yeah, but in terms of the transport-related ones, I'm not really uh, across that. Councillor Brown. Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Um, just trying to wrap up that thought that I had before, um, when we do have that procurement policy come back to us, it would be great to see the emissions in it, um, or an emissions consideration in it. Is that already part and parcel, or do we need an action item to I don't try think that? we need a specific action item. I'm sure yeah. that that will be um, included as part of the procurement policy considerations when procurement comes um, to you at this meeting, I think, next quarter. Brilliant. Yep. Mm. Great. Looks like the questions are drying up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Councillor Bowe. Sorry. One last one. Lucky last. 
Um, I don't know if it's a question or a suggestion or to seek your um, feedback on, Madam Chair. Um, on page 11 of this report, it suggested that Napier should consider implementing an operational zero carbon policy and adding climate considerations to internal governance processes and council reports. And what I was considering was adding a recommendation to that effect to the options that are in front of us to vote on. Would that be in order? I'm wondering whether that would be better placed or that part of the discussion um, when the plan actually comes mm -hmm. to us next time round. Yeah. Councillor Bogue, um, I, I think th this is sort of part way through a process. Um, so I think we should let the, the process complete itself and then we can make those types of recommendations if it isn't clear or if the clarity isn't there for you once the plan has been delivered. Are you comfortable with that? Um, well, my suggestion was going to be that the emission suggestion was my motion, that the emission reduction plans include implementing the addition of climate considerations to internal government processes and council reports. So it would be a direction um, and something that I'd like to see included in this upcoming um, emission reduction plan. So basically you're, you're offering a substantive motion for us to consider. Yes, mm. I'm just sort of putting it on the mm. table whether, whether you will consider. I'm, I'm happy to take some discussion on that. My, my thoughts I, I've made quite clear. I think that that's a next step mm. thing um, for the next meeting and the next report that's um, provided to us. But um, Councillor Brown. Um, just looking at the options in the paper there, option A... Um, as a recommendation, I think covers off on both what Maxine was saying and the recommendation as well. Does that make sense? So option A, receive the report, acknowledge and support the planned approach to develop emission reduction plans and recommended targets as part of the wider climate change strategy, complementing NCC's climate adaption plan. And Maxine's point, covers off that it was part of that. It does. I'm just wondering why our um, recommendation is different from it's our different. option. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So if we could all just quickly look at that um, 2.6, our options there, um, would we be happy to consider option A instead of the recommendation, which is that we receive the report? Yeah, I'd be happy to move option A. Definitely. Any further discussion on that? So procedurally, I'll just need to, some advice from Gemma as to how we do this. We're going to be changing it. So we have a mover for option A, mm. which is a substantive motion, basically, isn't it? Mm. And we've got a seconder in Councillor Bogue. Uh, yeah. Can I just speak to that? You certainly yeah, can. Yeah, I'm sort of... Uh, like your initial position, we're going through a process at the moment. We don't actually have comparative information, and I'd hate to set ourselves up to fail mm. if we if we don't understand what other local governments are able to do. Uh, if we set you know an extreme outcome at this stage, um, I think it would be helpful to actually have that other comparative information from other local governments before we get too excited about what we can or can't achieve. Mm. Could I just comment on that, Madam Chair? Um, could we just, just hang on a second? I'm just getting a little bit of advice a about how to... Because basically we've got a substantive motion. You need a seconder. We have a seconder. We have a mover and Councillor Brown, a seconder and Councillor Bogue. Okay. So then you can open up this Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm, any, any further discussion from Councillor Simpson before I... Would you like to speak to the motion then, Councillor Brown? Yeah, sure. I think that the, the staff have put forward a, a great report that gives us our baseline. Um, I think in line with some of the other committees and the work that we're doing, this is in line with where we're heading as a region. Um, we haven't set any targets yet. That comes in the next stage. And although I, I hear Councillor Simpson's point around wanting to benchmark ourselves against other councils, I think it's important that we kind of compete with ourselves and just try and do what it is that we can do as a city rather than worrying excessively about what others are doing. But I think it'd be a good measuring point as well to include his thoughts. Okay, uh, Councillor Bogue, would I'll you like to write up? For now. Thank yeah. you. Um, would anyone else like to speak to the motion? 
Oh, for it or against it at this stage. Thank you, Mayor Wise. Thank you, through the Chair. Um, I'm going to speak in support of the motion. Um, looking at the wording of the motion, it is around acknowledging and supporting the planned approach. We're not committing to any um, plan in particular or recommend targets at the moment. That's what's going to come back to us in the next um, report and phase of this. Um, but by including um, that acknowledgement and support, at this point in time, um, I think it's important that it, it does show that we are committed to developing these emission reduction plans um, and some some targets around that. So happy to speak in support. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak before I think the seconder will? No, I'll be right. Thank no, you're happy? Okay, well, do we have that revised um, motion? Can we pop it up so that everyone can see it, please? I've already got the oh. information. Oh, how do I stop sharing that? Mm -hmm. So what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. And why, why do we have to no. hold back and ask for the last one? It's about an expense. Oh, the motion the motion is about the It's going to be a big expense when climate change comes through. Right. Thank you. We'll just get it up there so everyone can see it and we know what we're voting on. I'm, I'm happy with the way um, I, I think the mover and the seconder are happy with the way that it is worded in option A of the report. Mm. That's what yep, so that's what we've got in front of us. Mm -hmm. So we just need an A for the received and a B for the acknowledged. Is that what you're saying, Carolyn? Is that your advice? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that it comes back to, you, to us? Uh, that, that's covered in the paper, that the plan comes back to us in the next prosperous meeting. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right so this is the substantive motion um, in front of us. I will put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. There we go. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have our quarterly report, um, and we welcome Talia to present. Um, so this is the quarterly report for the three months ended 31 March 2024. Um, the report does show that uh, we have a year-to-date net operating shortfall of 9.9 .9 million. However, this is favourable to the expected position uh, of a deficit of 28.1 million. Uh, this is made up of uh, additional revenue and lower expenditure. Uh, we presented a forecast at your 28th of March meeting, so we've got the information for that in the summary. Uh, there was only a month between the forecast and this uh, quarterly report, so uh, for this quarterly report we are uh, tracking well to the forecast as well. Um, yes, other than that, I'll take the report as read. Thank you. Thank you, Talia. Open for questions. Thank you, Mayor Weiss. Thank you, through the Chair. Um, just with regards to the other revenue of 4.9 million above budget due to a legal settlement, um, just wanting to know, is that is that sum of money being, being ring-fenced at this point in time? Just aware there's some other things happening nationally that, that may impact us um, being able to keep that money? <laughs> um, I'll answer that one through the Chair. Uh, yes, you're correct, um, and we're aware that um, there are some other issues happening at the moment, so we've ring-fenced it, set it aside, so that um, just in case we may need to return it or part of it. 
Thank you. Any other questions? I have I have a couple. They're a little in the weedy, but they, they make sense to me, so if we could just bear with. Um, I noted uh, in our customer service requests uh, the percentage of inquiries that come by department, which was really fascinating considering that customer service is only, uh, I think, I don't know, less than 1% apparently, according to the graph. Um, those big ones, things like infrastructure, city services, animal control that are making up over the 10% mark, what sort of customer service training do we have in place for our staff in those departments? I'm happy for anyone to answer. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure we have anybody here could, from... Could we make that an Rachel action? Here, but that's a, we can come back yeah. to you with an answer for that. Yeah. If, if that's how our, our community, our stakeholders are coming to us, then it would be really interesting to know um, how we're prepared to respond to them. We can follow up with a, an action point. We'll put that on the action register. <laughs> Thank you. Back that would be great. Um, and just one other question. Around our transportation <laughs> customer service, I note um, that we have a mandatory uh, DIA performance measure there that we weren't able to hit this quarter. I'm just wondering what provisions we have in place to remedy it um, and, and what are the consequences of not hitting those um, since it is a DIA measure? Do you have a page number? I'm so sorry, I've written on? notes in my no. computer, sorry. Ah, I think I've got it here. There were no page numbers either. Oh. <laughs> we can get that oh, well, not on here. Here. <laughs> Is that a measure? <clears throat> no. Uh, right, yes, so um, it was just around uh, not be, not having the time to get the measure for this quarter, so right. it is absolutely something that we can go back and measure for the full year. Um, we, yes, so that will, uh, we will be able to report on it, uh, we just can't confirm whether it will be um, up to the target, uh, based on the first and second quarter I would expect that it would be. Um, if we were to miss that uh, in terms of it being a DIA mandatory measure, um, it, audit would probably just look at it further and confirm that we are reporting it correctly. Uh, they already uh, review the DIA measures quite closely, but it's more just about having it available to be and visible uh, for the public. Great, cool. Thank you, Talia. If no one has any further questions, we will. Um, I'll just I just add one thing. Sure, it's Thank actually in the right. report, but just noting that. Um, we're working towards, um, for the first quarter of 24-25, coming to you with a updated, improved format of this report. Cool. Um, so we're working on that at the moment. So I hope it'll be something fresher and more <coughs> useful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very important. Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Price. Sorry, I'm just going to follow up on the transport. Um, does that hinge on the regional council feedback and how it's operated for us to have a strategy? For that particular measure, mm. um, I, I'm not 100% sure on that. No, I don't know. We can, uh, yep, we would have to come back on that one as well. Okay. Okay. Sounds like the information just wasn't available at the time. That's not quite how I read it, but thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Councillor Brown. Yeah. Kia ora, through the chair. Um, on the waste, uh, on the water supply performance summary, the one that we are constantly underperforming on is our eight hour target, and it's suggested that it's probably quite um, overly optimistic. And it says that we, get, that we have the opportunity to review it in our three year plan. Is that coming to us with a recommendation? Is that part of our three year plan? Um, when you adopt the three-year plan, it would be it would make up part of the full document uh, where you would be adopting it all. Um, it I don't think it would be a separate recommendation outside of that for that specific measure. Okay. So you will have an opportunity to review those performance measures in the LTP or the three-year plan document when it comes to you for adoption on the twenty seventh. That's correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
Councillor Gregg. Oh, yes, through the chair. Um, just under the title environmental health, um, noting that fire control requests have jumped from 26 in 2022 and 2023 to 97 in 2023, 2024. And just, I know it's a very specific question, but I'm just wondering, you know, do we have reasons? Is there some reason behind that? It would be quite interesting to know if there's some issue that we need to be looking at. Uh, again, we'd need to come Thank back to you, you on that. Sorry. We can take yeah, that. Very specific. Thank you. If I have no more questions, we'll just review the recommendation to receive the quarterly report for the three months ended 31 March 2024. Can I have someone to move that, please? Uh, thank you, Councillor Gregg, and seconded Councillor Price. Just one one question. question, quickly. <laughs> Will there be um, action points put down for those two items that we're talking about? Yes, please. yes, please. and uh, they will appear in our action register. Thank you. Thank you for seconding also. Um, would you like to speak to that? Yes, um, thank you for the report, and it's great to see that 81% of the KPIs have been achieved or are on target for years, and that's amazing. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that? No, thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the motion? No? All right. Well, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. We have another PowerPoint for our next uh, presentation. We have our Category 3 Voluntary Buyout, time frame for program completion. Thank you, Anne and Catherine. Thank you. Chair. Um, morning, Nakoto. Uh, this report is about our Category 3 um, program and about program completion. Um, there's some recommendations in the report that will state that we're looking to close the program down by the end of the year. Um, Hastings District Council received the same paper on the, well, a very similar paper on the 23rd of May and they approved the recommendations. Uh, prior to going through the paper, I thought I'd give you a quick rundown of where we're at with our um, Napier's 14 properties and the 166 properties overall. So just to give you a bit of a recap, uh, the overarching objective on the policy was about the removal of risk to life associated with people living in Category 3 land. And there were three other objectives there in the policy. Um, the first one about residents having a clear pathway and certainty, um, long-term positive outcomes for the community and, and the environment and affordability for ratepayers. And there were also some principles involved too. Um, but more of a recap, the process was broken down into four stages. The first was an information phase and that's where we have the initial meeting with the property owner and, and try and find out about as much information as possible um, on their property. The second stage was the valuation process the third stage was taking them through the offer process, and then finally um, completion and settlement. So this is just giving you a bit of an update of where we are. Um, the figures in the paper were correct as at 15th of May, but there's been a little bit of progress since then. Um, so of the 166 properties across Napier and Hastings, there's only seven meetings left to schedule. Um, so most property owners are, are, are through the process. In Napier, we have 14 Category 3 properties and we only have one meeting left to schedule. In the, <coughs> excuse me, in the paper, there was two meetings left, but we had one last Friday. So, um, and the, the person, sorry, the property owners for that property that we haven't met with yet, we are engaging with them. They have a bit of a complex um, situation on their property, so they are, they are engaging with us to date. They, we just haven't managed to get them to start the process yet. Um, and you'll see in Napier, we've got four offers approved and three have settled. So um, we're, we are working through the process um, pretty quickly. Just some highlights here, just some percentages. 93% um, of the owners are actively engaged in the process, which is brilliant. 75% um, of valuations have been complete and 73% have received an offer, a letter explaining the offer in front of them. Um, in May, I think only 38% of property owners had received an offer, so now there's up to 73%, so we've, progress has been quite quick 
sorry, in March, sorry, it was 38%. Now it's 73% of property owners have received an offer. So we are moving through pretty quickly. Um, the six owners representing seven properties are choosing not to engage at the moment, and all of those owners are in Hastings um, area. So our forecasts are showing that most owners will have received an offer by mid-September, and there may be a small number of complex cases that may take a bit longer. Uh, again, this is just percentages, but Napier is at the top. So 29% uh, have settled, 79% um, we, we provided them with an offer, and, um, and there's only one property that has, has not started the process yet. So now on to the paper. Um, so as I said, most property owners will have received an offer by mid-September. And through the policy, once they've, we've given the property owners an offer, they have three months to accept it. So that will bring us to mid-December. So the program will be substantially complete by the end of the year. So what we're asking today is um, if the, the if owners need to be engaged in the process by the 31st of August, they will be able to complete the process by the end of the year. Um, so that's the kind of key date for, for owners to be engaged in the process. We will still provide support for some owners that may need it, that may take a little bit longer than that, depending on, um, in Hastings, they have some split category properties, and here we have some um, other issues with one of the properties. So we will still provide support to that property if, if they are willing to engage in the process with us. Um, so following recommendations, if council approves the recommendations, we will um, let our property owners know um, that, that these dates are in place um, and we'll be looking um, to close the program by the end of the year. And one more thing. Um, so in the paper it mentions that there are, is a $5 million cap set aside, so closing the program early won't, um, won't adjust won't won't adjust that figure at all because that cap will be that money is there for um, all of our property owners, but we do pay a notional cost to keep the um, office open. So the latest figures for Napier, we have a five million dollar cap. The latest forecasts have us at three point nine million dollars, and that is pretty accurate. There's only two properties that have yet to be valued, so that that's pretty accurate. That's a little bit lower than what it was at um, earlier. So we are underneath our cap, which is good. So that's it from me, but open to any questions, if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Councillor Brown. Through you, Madam Chair. A um, bit of a left field one. Um, you know how we had to go through a special consultative process to set up this activity? If we close this off now, and then we have another disaster, would we have to go through that process again? Yeah, so through the Chair, we... Um, this is a voluntary process and there's no legislation that covers it. So we didn't go, th we, add, we went through a special consultation process to add the activity to what was our long-term plan. And the activity was very specific to Cyclone Gabriel. Um, and so this activity is, is about the cyclone. Um, I'm not sure what will happen in the future. Um, it'll be a conversation that councils will need to have with central government for any future events. Yeah, Councillor Simpson. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, there's a term used in here, um, seek an extension. Mm -hmm. um, so the timelines that you've provided for us, based on what you know yep. about the um, parties, mm -hmm. if any of those parties were to seek an extension, would that affect the timelines that you've referred to or affect um, how an outcome would be achieved? Uh, through the Chair, no, it wouldn't. Two of our properties have sought an extension, so when they receive the offer letter, they have three months to accept. These two property owners both have a third party that w wants to move the house because the house <coughs> is still structurally sound. Um, for those situations, we have um, crunched the numbers um, and, it, and it makes sense for the council to have that house moved and it makes sense for the property owner to have the house moved. So. They have not signed the offer yet because 
they want to, we want to all make sure that the property owners are able, sorry, the third party are, is able to move the property. So we are, in those two situations, we are confident that the property owners and the third party are doing their best, um, making their best endeavours to move the property. Um, and and so we will keep doing that. Um, if, if, if it looks like it's not happening, then, then we, we won't extend the time anymore. But it, it won't um, stop the program completing because we can still work with those two owners um, going forward once the office is shut. Thank you. Um, just one from me, just seeking clarity. Um, and so with our total costs, we're under our cap currently, but there are two properties yet to come. Is that yes. correct and be valued? Yes. And so there is a level of comfortability that we will remain under our cap, even with those two? Uh, I, yes, they are. So it is, it is the 3.9 million does include the 14 properties, but two of them are not valued. So it is a forecast, but we are comfortable right. that we will stay underneath the cap. OK, cool. Thank you. What else? No? Well, I will ask Gemma just to pop our recommended resolution up on the screen for us. We've got a five-parter, so we'll take it all together. Um, a is to approve the voluntary buyout program be substantively concluded, effective 31 December 2024. That we approve that the voluntary buyout policy cease to be operative once the last owner who has engaged in good faith in the voluntary buyout program prior to 31 August 24 has been supported through to settlement or chooses to opt out of the process. That we direct the chief executive to make provision to support owners who have engaged in the voluntary buyout program in good faith prior to 31 August, I think that should be 2024, <laughs> not 2004, <laughs> um, to conclude the voluntary buyout program after 31 December 24, if the support is still required. That we note the Chief Executive will make thorough efforts to encourage owners who have not yet engaged in the program or who have stalled for some reason to make final decisions on whether they will re-engage or would like to engage with the VBO program. And note that if property owners are unwilling to engage or re-engage with the voluntary buyout program in good faith by 31 August 24, um, by accepting an initial meeting with the voluntary buyout office and agreeing to be supported through the valuation stage so offers can be constructed by 30 September 24, that the voluntary buyout program will be closed to these owners. Yes. Councillor Price. Has Hastings adopted that, has they? Has On the 23rd of May, it was my understanding. Okay. So we're just doing the same as what they're doing? Yes, that is correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Working in tandem. Yeah. Would you would you like to move the motion? Oh, move it, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Price. And Councillor Simpson, you're seconding? I'll second that, yeah. Fantastic. Would you like to speak to that? Well, I just think it sets a, a little bit of a line um, in direction to where we're going on this, and it'd be good to... Uh, to uh, close it and also wing in tandem with Hastings is a logical way to deal with it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that, Councillor? Yeah, like right. Councillor Price, if, if Hastings are confident that this is the right move and they're significantly more impacted than, than we are and our residents are, um, and staff have confidence that they can wrap the process up, then I'm more than happy to second the motion. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to it? Councillor Crystal. I'd just like to really acknowledge the people that have gone through this process. This is a terrible legacy that Cyclone Gabriel left us. And I actually spoke to someone that on the weekend that has settled and the look of relief um, that they have been through. They said it was a long, drawn-out process and it was really hard, but they are extremely relieved to be able to move on with their lives now. So it's really good to see that we're nearly, nearly through this. Thank you, Councillor Crystal. All good points from all of our speakers. Mm -hmm. um, that's three in support. Would anyone like to speak against it? No? Well, I will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move to our last um, item on our agenda today. We have the Hawke's Bay Airport Limited, the Statement of Intent Feedback. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Um, so this is just um, an information paper for the committee um, and just an opportunity to share with the committee 
feedback that has been provided with the airport on their statement of intent. Um, I know there have been a number of questions raised around um, just checking in whether or not we have provided feedback and I thought it would be an opportunity to share with the committee the feedback that has been provided um, and open up um, for questions and feedback um, with the committee if there are any questions. Thank you. Well, we will open for those. We'll take discussion or comment as well. Not question. Well, that was pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, I, I'm actually happy to move this one from the Chair, which is to note and receive the report titled Hawke's Bay Airport Limited Statement of Intent Feedback. Um, if I could have someone to second that, please. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Welcome. Um, I'm happy to speak to it. I, I actually I appreciate this, mm. this information coming to us. I think that it does prevent or provides answers to the questions, um, especially, I think, around the dividend um, which seems to be a bit of a sticking point in people's yeah. minds. I think, you know, you've highlighted the fact that um, there is a significant level of debt and that that needs to be managed, but also as a as an entity, we are representing our community, they are the stakeholders, and making sure that we are, I think, keeping some healthy tension around our expectations and, and making that clear to um, HBEL as to what we, we are wanting from them. I think that that's really important, so it's great to have... Yeah, great to have this information come to us like this. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Uh, no, I think you've covered the main point in relation to dividend, but I'd also like um, to, to support the um, feedback provided in, around the solar, solar farm development mm. and the fact that um, Napier City Council needs to be uh, a, a major stakeholder and um, be involved in those discussions. So I think uh, the feedback being provided is, is very relevant. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put that all the way in favour. Please say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thank you. Well, we'll end with our closing karakia. Kito te rangi mari ki runga inga iwi kato o ahiri. Kia piki te ora te kaha me te maramatanga in our walk at all, TA Maudiora.